Horror and Christmas will always blend with decadence, like liquid chocolate and mini marshmallows. The tradition of being haunted on the holidays isn't as weird as your angelic mother might make you think. There's a whole horror subgenre devoted to Yuletide massacres, which brings us to a very special holiday Cinefix movie list. Let's take a look at the 12 best Christmas horror films. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol is a story about a man confronted by festive ghosts. It was first published in 1843. Victorian Christmas celebrations in the late 1800s and early 1900s weren't complete without fireside ghost stories. Countries outside the United States cherish folklore about evil Christmas demons unlike jolly old Saint Nick who beat unruly children with switches or even snatch naughty youngsters in sacks. For any sugar plum sweethearts or squeaky clean elves out there who are wondering why we dedicate an entire video to Christmas horror nightmares, understand that Christmas and horror have been bedfellows for centuries. Horror is a genre that's forever stigmatized as evil meant to corrupt innocence. Maybe that's why Christmas horror is so enticing. How many times can we watch the same cheerful Christmas movies with the same warm spirits and zero stakes? And while Christmas movies come wrapped in as many different packages as any other film genre, there's a horror answer for just about all of them. Chris Columbus's Home Alone is a seminal Christmas comedy written with the sincerity of John Hughes, but what if Home Alone was allowed to be a knockdown drag out horror movie? Chris Peckover's babysitter thriller, Better Watch Out, brutally tests the Home Alone paint can swing like a banned Mythbusters episode, pondering the violent potential if Home Alone wasn't fun for the whole family. Although, there's a film that goes 10 steps further. For our number 12 pick, let's introduce you to Renee Manzor's Home Alone before Home Alone, Deadly Games. The story of 1989's Deadly Games, aka Game Over, aka Dial Code Santa Claus, aka 3615 Code Para Noel, aka Hide and Freak, almost ended with legal action. Deadly Games made its film festival premiere in 1989, a full year before Home Alone would charm U.S. audiences in 1990. So why don't American audiences refer to Home Alone as a Deadly Games imitator if they're similar enough where a furious Manzor wanted to sue? Because Manzor's Deadly Games didn't release stateside until a restored version from the American Genre Film Archive played Austin's Fantastic Fest in 2018, after which the film was finally picked up for U.S. distribution. It's hard to deny the similarities between Deadly Games and Home Alone after you watch both. Young Thomas is your everyday French tech whiz son obsessed with American action movies like Rambo, left alone with his protective dog and diabetic partially blind grandfather on Christmas Eve by his workaholic department store manager mother. Through a series of unfortunate events, Thomas accidentally invites a deranged invader dressed as Santa inside his family's castle, who he must defeat with minimal help. Deadly Games becomes frequently comical and thrilling as the war-painted youth rigs Christmas time traps from toys and decorations. It's a darker experience that begs what if Home Alone had more punch, psychotics, and suspenseful danger? The answer, with resounding excitement, is the lost but now found Deadly Games. Christmas might have evolved into a consumer's holiday over decades, but let us not forget the reason for the season is rooted in religious texts. Christ is bored in a stable after immaculate conception. That's the real Christmas miracle. Some horror films choose to roast how the Christmas spirit is now about expensive presents and greedy wishes, while others dare return to theological roots. There are plenty of laughs to be had with your silly and light secret Santa or sleigh bells midnighters, yet, to quote a few wise Canadian hicks, and you don't f with tradition, especially on Christmas. Coming in at number 11, we summon the Day of the Beast. ¿No le parece que es usted un poquito mayor para andar robando libros, padre? Necesito ese libro. Yo también necesito un montón de cosas. Pero estoy aquí de 8 a 2 y de 4 a 9 para poder pagármelas. No puedo comprarlo. ¿No puede comprarlo? No. ¿Y por qué no puede? ¿No tiene dinero? No, 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 no es eso. ¿Y qué es entonces? Tengo que acostumbrarme a hacer el mal. ¿Por qué tiene que hacer el mal? Porque tengo que ponerme en contacto con Satán. Ya. Yeah. Alex de la Iglesia blends Spanish and Italian horror influences into The Day of the Beast, a 90s co-production between the two countries. 
It's a Christmas horror curveball that throws everything but the kitchen sink at audiences. A Basque priest who must sin as much as possible, a metalhead Satanist record store stereotype, and an occult TV show host band together to prevent the Antichrist's birth on Christmas Eve. It's wacky, darkly comedic, and filled with hellscapes that boast demonic costumes and wild practical effects. Humor derives from the trio's inability to cleanly execute plans, which mounts collateral damage throughout Madrid. How hard is it to get virgin blood these days anyway? De La Iglesia is known for his extravagant horror concepts, very aligned with Guillermo del Toro's sensibilities in certain ways, and I'd say a blasphemous buddy comedy about an apocalyptic, atypical holiday quest fits the bill. Yes, there have already been Christmas horror remakes. Only a handful, just about the number of arms and legs on a gingerbread man, but they still exist. In 2016, Miguel Angel Vivas remade a gruesome French classic with Inside, but I'd rather talk about the original, so I will, in a spot later on. But then there are two Black Christmas updates that have become polarizing examples of horror remakes gone wrong or right, but that shouldn't scare you away from remakes altogether. At number 10, we have a Christmas horror remake savior in Stephen C. Miller's Silent Night. It's a despicably naughty slasher that drips with Christmas time decor and repulsive massacres, one of the last of its kind by post-2012 horror standards when A24 horror became the newest slow burn trend. It's got everything on your Christmas horror wish list, from Malcolm McDowell shouting about avocado on hamburgers, to flamethrowers for chest and nut roasting, from mounted antler trophy callbacks to fresh expressions of violence like a poor soul's encounter with a tree farm's wood chipper. There's copious usage of green and red lighting overlays, as well as a mean streak that make even the Grinch blush. I hope you're okay with bratty kids getting what they deserve, by the way. Miller hits on all cylinders in this inspired remake that stands well on its own as a creative original slasher. Empowered by a complete disinterest in playing nice, even by usual horror fan expectations. It's more than a stocking stuffer, it's the total package. <laughs> Child's Play not only sparked one of horror's most enduring and iconic franchises, but it also welcomed countless holiday season imitators. Gary Busey voices a killer cookie in The Ginger Dead Man as serial killer Millard Findelmeyer, whose cremated ashes are baked into a brown and frosted treat that comes alive. In The Killing Tree, maniac Clayton Slater is summoned into the vessel of a Christmas tree that talks, stalks, and murders. Charles Lee Ray opened the door to supernatural transference of psychopaths into new bodies or objects, but there's one Christmas horror example that uses its new figure best of all. At number nine, we've got Michael Cooney's Jack Frost. What's the matter? Did somebody die? How many families rented the horror version of Jack Frost instead of the wholesome 1998 family comedy of the same name starring Michael Keaton? Literally happened to me in high school. Jack Frost is child's play, but with chemicals instead of voodoo rituals and a murderous snowman instead of a killer doll. You'll recognize a pre-American pie, Shannon Elizabeth, in Cooney's bastardization of Frosty the Snowman, as the titular Jack dispatches locals in a backwater town using a host of goofily fatal means. Maybe you're hugged to death in the shower or strangled by colored Christmas lights before choking on ornament shards. Jack Frost continues his serial spree in Snow Mountain, USA, voiced by Scott McDonald, as channeled through a blend of Freddy Krueger and Chucky. It's not exactly appropriate content for the whole family, which scores Midnighter points because humor isn't hidden or ignored. The situation deals more with Snickers than seriousness. Just don't expect the same quality from Jack Frost 2, Revenge of the Mutant Killer Snowman, where Jack Frost takes a tropical Pacific island vacation in hopes of killing the man responsible for his death. Consider Jack Frost lightning in a snow globe. Holiday celebrations usually revolve around delicious feasts where families break bread and enjoy each other's company. Whether you're serving elaborate brunch punch bowls or presenting your finest roast beast for dinner, films like David Folk's Night Visitors mess with this beloved American tradition of overstuffing guests with tasty morsels while everyone smiles, interrupting pleasant meals with deviants who make a mockery of manners. All the culinary preparation and perfecting of decor is for nothing, wasted on home invaders. But of all the doomed dinner parties, Camille Griffin's Silent Night comes in at number eight. How come you 
never f me. Wow. Jesus, Sandra. Wow. I'm just wondering. James, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, please do not apologise for me, darling. No, that's right. You should probably apologise for yourself. Eh? Oh, keep your knickers on. You know, just something that always bothered me. You know? Everyone wanted to f me. I didn't. Why not? I just never really did it for me. This Silent Night is not to be confused with Stephen C. Miller's slasher that was previously covered. Griffin takes the approach of causing chaos from the inside out. Silent Night is a newer addition to the Christmas horror canon, a sudsy soiree about friends and family sharing Christmas traditions before the end of humanity. Guests debate whether Mother Earth is finally revolting or the Russians have enacted their master apocalypse plan, but our civilization's fate is inescapable. Toxic gas will engulf each nation one by one. The UK lasts until Christmas, granting one last December celebration to characters played by Kira Knightley, Matthew Good, Kirby Howell Baptiste, and more. Partiers sip on bubbly and debate the ethics of their government's issued suicide pills to spare inevitable agony as the countdown clock creates enough social distortion to broil a little tension between companions. It's a twisted take on dinner parties from hell, marked by themes that go down with an unnerved giggle. Griffin's command over snark and suspense is tight as a noose, as characters say all those uncouth things they've once held behind bitten tongues. It's the end of the world. Why not speak what's on your mind? Horror anthologies are already a hard enough sell as is, and the Christmas horror anthology pool doesn't really help. Some of the worst Christmas horror movies you'll find are misguided anthologies. Death Simber is an advent calendar of horror shorts that range budgets, themes, and durations for an excruciating two plus hours. Psycho Santa is a low budget perv out, and Holiday Hell needed a few more passes to tighten things up. There are Christmas horror segments, like in Holidays or Tales from the Crypts episode and All Through the House, that fare better, but there's one Christmas horror anthology that rises above. At number seven, we have a Christmas horror story. Sparkles! <laughs> This Canadian collection of Yuletide terror stands above all the other Christmas horror anthologies because of its commitment to unrelenting darkness. William Shatner narrates and serves as our wraparound host playing Dangerous Dan, an alcoholic radio DJ whose smooth voice weaves in and out of four chilling chapters. Changelings infiltrate families, abused ghosts possess schoolgirls, and Santa fights zombie elves before squaring off with the professional wrestling version of Krampus. And I don't want to oversell the good versus evil battle that takes place when muscle-bound Krampus starts swinging his chain in front of a grimacing Santa, but it's a knockout jingle brawl. There's a fortunate amount of grim tidings packed into each segment, all culminating into a psychotic break that sells the macabre vulnerability allowed by Christmas horror catharsis. A Christmas Horror Story checks all the boxes of a proper horror anthology. Varied segments, meticulous time management, and one solid wraparound that ties things together nicely with a bow on top. Christmas is all about rosy cheeks, giddy children, peace on earth, and all that beautiful North Pole magic, which is where the Christmas horror genre comes in. Plain and simple, sometimes you need an antidote to the constant positivity of the Christmas season. Films like The Lodge, The Children, Shiten, and many others have shown that even Christmas's wonderland embrace can't protect us from the bleakest visions of uncivilized depravity. For the pinnacle of feel-bad Christmas storytelling, we revisit a French extremity classic. At number six, we have Alexander Bustillo and Julian Maris inside. In the most twisted reading possible, Inside is about someone being jealous of the gift another holds. Beatrice Dolly stars as an expecting mother on Christmas Eve still reeling from a car wreck that left her husband dead. She's alone, she's physically strained, and she's anything but safe when an unidentified woman tries to enter her home. If you're 
privy to the French extremity movement, especially Bustillo and Mallory's prior works, you already know how spectacularly bloody and unforgivably vulgar inside will probably become. The gist boils down to this. The random woman outside wants the baby inside Dolly's tummy. Scissors, knitting needles, aerosol flamethrowers, they're all implements of bodily punishment as the ladies beat and mutilate each other senseless. It's a rare Christmas horror movie that succeeds without copious amounts of seasonal decorations because it's just so disrespectfully effective. Watching the torment Dolly's protagonist undergoes, Inside is one of those impossible to recommend but sensationally potent horror flicks that show what Bustillo and Mallory are all about. Viewers, beware. You do not have a comfort zone padded enough to survive inside. I didn't, I tell you that much. So, there's a bit of a caveat that comes with this entry. The Nightmare Before Christmas earns its praise as a horror musical. It's become part of pop culture thanks to cover albums, stores like Spencer's and Hot Topic. Plus, how can you deny Danny Elfman? That said, there's another Christmas horror musical out there that deserves just as much recognition. So, spoiler alert for a future entry, we're honoring both. The kiddies can have Jack Skellington. More mature horror viewers can flip on this bloodthirsty delight when the youngsters go to bed. At number five, we have John McPhail's infectiously enchanting Anna and the Apocalypse. There's no evacuation coming. Well, so we'll get your car and leave town. And go where? Well, I don't know yet, but we'll figure something out. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. You can do anything. I'm getting my dad, all right? Yeah, and my gran and Lisa. Look, I want to find my mum too, but how are we going to get past all the zombies? Has there ever been a more perfect Scottish zombie musical set around Christmas than Anna and the Apocalypse? Well, more appropriately, has there ever been, well, that at all? Mr. McPhail's addictive horror musical gives a middle finger to high school musical sugarcoating and pummels the undead as Anna, played by Ella Hunt, sing smashes her way through a winter wonderland of deadheads. The soundtrack is magnificently catchy from Hollywood ending to soldier at war, while horror elements don't skimp on ferocity or beheadings by seesaws. It's an exuberant experience that captures the hopelessness when holiday cheer teases around every corner, but not without tapping into later feelings of joy that surge past cynicism. It's ultimately a feel-good flick that doesn't lie about the world's ugliness, presented as one of the more uniquely ambitious horror films, Christmas time or not, since release. It's also, on a sadder note, a tribute to the late Ryan McHenry, who you might know more famously as the man behind Ryan Gosling Won't Eat His Cereal. His BAFTA-winning short film, Zombie Musical, would spawn the feature idea for Anna and the Apocalypse, co-written by Alan McDonald and McHenry. The entire team kept McHenry in their hearts when they made Anna and the Apocalypse, a film brimming with love, loss, and the co-creator's legacy. Your head would spin if I told you how many no-budget Krampus movies exist. So, I will. Krampus, The Devil Returns. Krampus, The Christmas Devil. Krampus, The Reckoning. Krampus Origins, Mother Krampus. Krampus Unleashed, Mother Krampus 2, Sleigh Ride. And those are just the ones with Krampus in the title. You could sit watching horrendously animated Krampus designs wonkily chase teens or cops or whoever until your Christmas spirit vanishes. I think there's even a Viking one. When it comes to Krampus, there's only one king, though. It's no surprise that our number four selection is Michael Doherty's Krampus. Mom? Probably just squirrels. In this weather. <laughs> See? Squirrels. Right. Probably playing with their nuts. You can't talk about Christmas horror without Doherty's Krampus. The wicked whimsy of Weta Workshop's deviant playthings, snarling teddy bears, jack-in-the-box fiends that devour children as anacondas would, helps build Doherty's snowed-in prison of a universe. The mastermind behind Trick or Treat proves equally proficient at capturing Christmas's prominent concerns, from consumerism to obnoxious extended family members. From the very start, we're shown rabid shoppers trampling and beating one another for merchandise on shelves, and the true horrors haven't even begun 
begun yet. A cast including Adam Scott, Tony Collette, and David Koechner defend themselves against elvish hordes and gingerbread ninja assassins as childhood memories turn sour during Krampus' invasion. The essence of holiday wholesomeness becomes a lesson for those who've taken so much for granted, all before an ending snow globe tease that should have given us at least three more sequels by now. What is it about studios not giving Doherty the chance to create franchise legacies when they're so deserved? First Trick or Treat, now Krampus, the people demand justice. Everybody knows the Rankin-Bass Christmas specials that clog television schedules all December. Animation is often thought of for the children, a prehistoric ideology nonetheless. But Christmas horror has the same, albeit lesser known, representation. From cartoons like the action horror adventure Infinite Santa 8000, to claymation shorts like Trent Shy's The Night Terror Before Christmas, animation proves it can be meant for adults as well. Of course, there's one example that's approved for all ages. You know what's coming. At number three, we have Henry Selick's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Listen, everyone. I want to tell you about Christmas Town. What's this? What's this? Stop motion everywhere. Nope, I'm not doing it. Jack Skellington. The Nightmare Before Christmas might be kid friendly, but that doesn't stop horror influences from spilling out of Oogie Boogie's burlap booty. It's the perfect blend of spooky season charms with Christmas time cheer, like an olive branch between holidays that some people think should never speak to one another. There's a tenderness to Jack's uniting of fears and figgy pudding because everyone deserves to experience Santa's magic at least once. There's also poignance to overall themes of living outside classifiable boxes, sung by characters who decide there's more to life than appointed routines. The Nightmare Before Christmas oozes grandiose gothic art designs that have become famous throughout pop culture for a reason, along with Danny Elfman's vocal performance as just one of many singers in the cast of Spooky Silly Creations. This one is for the whole family and should be shared whether October or December for the tingliest of sensations, a film so pure and lovely it'll make your thumper grow three sizes. Christmas horror slashers are the most populated of all the Christmas horror subgenres. It's so simple to dress an actor in a Santa costume and point them towards victims. Crazy clauses have been slicing up victims for decades in titles like Don't Open Till Christmas, Christmas Evil, Silent Night, Deadly Night, it's already mentioned remake Silent Night, and countless more we don't have the time to name. Filmmakers will keep trying to one-up predecessors of the Christmas slasher subgenre, but so far there remains only one constant truth. No one's done it better than the OG Christmas slasher, not even the two remakes that have followed. At number two, we have Bob Clark's sorority slasher, Black Christmas. Mr. Clark, one of the grandfathers of the modern slasher, helped cultivate a genre movement. Black Christmas perfects a stalk and stab template that will be dittoed until extinction, and yet it's hardly been outdone. Olivia Hussey, Margot Kidder, and Marion Waldman find themselves in a sorority house with terrified sisters and caretakers who generate gallons of transmittable fear. Deaths are more about innocence erased than how corpses are gored, because billies peering through peepholes or perverse phone calls are always the scariest sounds and sights. It's Christmas, daughters won't be coming home to their parents, and no one can determine why. That's all Black Christmas needs to become genre royalty. Slashers have since taken the wrong messages, and keep thinking that all slashers need to be successful is endless gore and massive body counts. You know how less can be more? Well, it works in the reverse as showcased by 2006's remake. More can absolutely be less when you sacrifice tension for gratuity. Black Christmas 74 is a classic case of triumphant execution because every good horror movie starts with an airtight narrative. Christmas horror ranks are filled with creatures yanked from Nutcracker suites and remodeled to frighten audiences. The movie Krampus is loaded with demonic toys. 
Treevenge brings trees to life and lets them get revenge on us saw-happy humans. Santa Jaws is about a Christmas-themed shark that hunts a child's family. Uh, do ask, but just at a later date. There are more monsters in Christmas horror than toys in Santa's workshops, but there's only one Christmas horror creature feature that everyone needs to watch. At number one, we have Joe Dante's Gremlins. If you don't like gremlins, we can't be friends. It's the pinnacle of holiday horror in the way charming puppetry animates a gremlin takeover that cackles, reigns anarchy, and translates cartoonish glee to live action molds. It's pure, practical effects chaos you just never see these days. Gizmo the Mogwai is everyone's favorite pet they'll never own. The green, speckled, scaly gremlins are hijinks masters from barroom takeovers to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves mumble alongs. Everyone has a favorite gremlin, and everyone wants to cuddle Gizmo. Whether whether you saw Gremlins years back or it's a new discovery. Zach Galligan and Phoebe Cates naturally engage with their prop co-stars, the same way that Joe Dante brings mischievous rubber figures to life through extra special effects. Gizmo steals your heart with each wide-eyed grin, and Cates demolishes your soul thanks to the most heartbreaking Christmas monologue, because Gremlins isn't only about yucks. It's endlessly enjoyable, yet never to be underestimated as the slicker horror narrative of Chris Columbus's script overpowers jokier highlights, which is why we think it's one of the best Christmas horror movies of all time. Turn on all the lights, check all the closets and cupboards, look under all the beds, because you never can tell. There just might be a gremlin in your house. There you have it. 12 holiday horror greats for all 12 days of Christmas. Was that unclear? what we were doing there with the 12 instead of the 10. I hope you guys didn't miss that this whole time. Anyway, let us know if we left off any of your favorites down in the comments, and be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more Cinefix movie lists. Mm -hmm.